Hi there, global citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I'm your host, Florence Adu, and I am still in Accra, and today is African Unity Day, which is very, I don't want to say nostalgic. It makes me think of all, well, it is kind of a step nostalgic. I think of all of the, the former leaders and the former freedom fighters that really put all of their efforts into forging a new and stronger and better Africa. And I just hope for the best because we're still not there. We're, we're working, we're trying, we're still not there. And I was listening to um, a lecture recently and someone said, the lecturer said that the problem with Africa is that we expect someone else to come and develop our countries for us. And to some extent that is by design and by reality, but until we shake that mentality, we'll still be a fairly ununified Africa. So let's think about that, folks. On a brighter note, I have a wonderful woman sitting next to me here in Accra, Ghana. She is the founder of CESA. It's a personal development organization. It is a space, a resource to assist others find some answers, guidance, and advice to make this life game more enjoyable for their benefit and the benefit of those around them. Miss Alvina Quason. Welcome thank to the podcast. You. Thank you, thank welcome, you. welcome, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank I'm, you. I'm really happy to be here. Yay. Very good. Happy. Good, good, good. So let's get started. Tell us where you're from, where you are local, and what is your craft. Okay. So I am British Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. I was born in the UK, London, and um, I'm of Ghanaian heritage. My parents are both from Central Region, Ghana. So I am a fancy me, a fancy me, papa. Okay. <laughs> Which means I'm a full fancy. Uh -huh. And what was the last bit? Where are you You're local? Where am I right. local? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Where am I local? I am a human yo-yo. So I am local in Accra. I am local in London. Okay. And then my work makes me local in a couple of other African countries like Sierra Leone, a little bit of Nigeria. Nice. So nice. local is very fluid. <laughs> okay. Okay. So before we go to your craft, tell us. A little bit more about your local in London okay and your local here in Ghana okay mm -hmm. so my local in London is Northwest London okay and um, Kentish town mainly mm -hmm. and it's diverse adjacent so I'm near <laughs> <laughs> I'm very close to areas where you've got a real nice mix hodgepodge of different cultures Camden Town, which is a popular tourist destination, is yeah. doorstep, and so you can get foods and clothes and everything from everywhere. Okay. Finsbury Park, Tottenham aren't far, okay. so that's my little home, a bit of Africa in, yes, yes. in um, London. So I really like my location. I can get around with ease, jumping on and off public transport, and getting around town is, is just part of life, easy, okay. easy living life sure. over there. Then we come to Accra. Uh -huh. Accra, um, I'm local to East Legon. Okay. I fell in love with it. Um, and we'll talk about some of my bouncing around, but I fell in love with East Legon years and years and years and years and years ago. And so I constantly keep gravitating back yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so East Legon's my local. You are not bouncing off on public Well, you can if you can do the chore chore thing. You can bounce on and off public transport. Otherwise, it's taxis which used to be a real headache with the whole negotiation, mm -hmm. constant conversation. Um, Uber and Bolt and Yango and all those others have made it a bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, so technology has helped in that dimension. Mm -hmm. But yeah, mm -hmm. I love being in East Legon for the restaurants, the bars. I think I mentioned that for the other side. So yeah, food is important to me. Music, galleries, and just, just that East Ligon is building its own kind of personality and it's a little bit, it's a little bit Ghana bougie, it's a little bit re -patty, it's a little bit diaspora, and yeah. it's a little bit local. Yeah. So there's, it's got a character and personality I can gel with, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. I would, I would agree with that description of cool. East Ligon. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Okay, so what is your craft? My craft, okay, so it's quite funny, like I love listening to you do your introduction because, um, Part of what you were saying, the sort of aim or ambition is manifesting. Mm -hmm. 
no better world. And I just love the word manifesting mm -hmm. because I have watched different friends be on your show mm -hmm. and I'm like, I want to be on Florence's <laughs> show. <laughs> and, um, and then the other day, just like that, we bump into each other and then it's like, oh, I want you on my show. It's like, okay, yeah. I manifested. Okay. <laughs> so like my craft is generally connection uh -huh. um, and engagement, particularly diaspora engagement. Okay. So I have been, and you can call it kind of, um, what's the word, navel gazing or a bit narcissistic, but I have just been driven by trying to understand the diaspora identity. Ooh. So my educational interests, my personal interests, and then my work have all been diaspora related. And so mm -hmm. obviously as I'm studying the outside, I'm also studying my inside. So my craft has been research. First it was a lot of really researching diaspora and development. So Africa and the development of Africa has mm -hmm. been so key and central to everything I do as well. And so it was looking at African development and then it was looking at diaspora identity and then it developed into looking at how diaspora make an impact mm. within development, mm -hmm. both inside and outside the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that's just ended up being the core of my work. Sure. Part of that understanding of diaspora and the different drivers, motivations, aims and ambitions actually crossed over. So in the UK, I've been working in the social sector and then I come to Ghana I go fully commercial, I go into property development. Right. But even then, it was very much looking at the properties we were building were affordable luxury. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, it was for me it worked because it was like, okay, this price point for diaspora who really want to come home, but they can't afford these like half a million in X houses and they don't quite want to go and live back at home and whatever. There was a certain developer who was developing these particular kind of homes, which were kind of in between the two. They had Western characteristics, but they had more affordable pricing. And they were in areas like East Legon is now, up and coming, a little bit of character. So it had a nice mix of the local meets global. So the local kind of feel mm -hmm. was very central to this developer. And so I, I worked with him, with them. Um, on a development called Beaufort Ridge. That was Beaufort Properties I was working with. Mm -hmm. And I could just really see how it connected with diaspora. And it also helped me shift from thinking capitalism is evil mm. to, okay, it has yeah. a purpose. And right. it can help create jobs, which is key to the work I do in my actual day-to-day -day job. Yeah. And it can also help to shift people's mindsets and perceptions on what's possible. Sure. So then people suddenly were yeah. able to see themselves living in Ghana, in Africa, mm -hmm. because they could see themselves having that lifestyle and mm -hmm. having a place of comfort that they understood on their terms. Yep. So it's not to say that they felt they were too good or whatever for a local um, property. And many do still want those local properties, but as an entrance in, you want something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. And these homes gave people that something familiar. Right. So, yeah, it's very much centered around diaspora and impact and engagement. Okay. Okay. So you're a diaspora life smith. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. And so then how do we get to Sessa? Yes. Right. yes so yes. Sessa, and I'm saying it badly, is Sessa, which Sessa. means change oh, yeah, okay. in a can. Okay. And... I've moved in and out of Ghana a few times. On each time, it's like a growth experience. I call it the Ghana University of Life. So doing lots of reading and work on myself and then the experiences you have in Ghana, you're literally, it's a life lesson. Every day is a life lesson. Sure. Every day. <laughs> um, but it helps you to grow and understand yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started to do workshops for young girls, helping them to think about and plan their future. And in doing that and thinking about my own journey, I started to look at Dinkra symbols. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Sesa Wusuban, which is change your spirit. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's it. It's oh. transformation. It's yes. finding a space where you can get resource and information and guidance. And now I'm growing it to become a community mm -hmm. of like-minded people on a journey. Mm -hmm. And then you can develop and grow together. Mm -hmm. And so Sesa came okay. from that. Okay, got it, got it. So let's take a, a step back. Mm -hmm. So before you decided, so you did social work in the UK, so that was your, your focus? It was or, social development. Social development, yes. Okay, and so what exactly about your, I mean, your education or what have you, 
prepared you to do that kind of work? Mm -hmm. And then for you to, and then how did you see yourself? I mean, you came and you, you said I was a, in the social sector and then I was a capitalist. So right. how does that work? Right. So tell us a little bit more about your first transition to coming and living in Ghana. Okay. Place, and from that point of where you were in the UK. Sure. Okay, so um, I didn't come to Ghana until I was 12. That was the first time I came to Ghana. Oh, okay. And I just remember stepping off the plane and this just this feeling just went <laughs> all over me. And it was really, it was like a weird awakening something just happened on that particular trip. And that trip we were here actually for my grandmother's funeral. So I never met my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't go out much. I didn't get out much or see very much. And I think, okay, if I was 12, 78. So yeah, it was about 1990. Mm -hmm. And I think Ghana was just recovering i think after from rolling yeah yes. and and all of all yes. of all of that yes. so it was a very different ghana to what you see yes. today very different ghana mm -hmm. and so everybody was worried about the abroachy girl and making sure that she didn't go out and so i spent a lot of time in the house actually but mm -hmm. that initial connection when i got off the plane just shifted something mm -hmm. like a huge shift within me and so i really always wanted to come back fast forward I've just come back, done the whole, I'm going to save the planet, mainly Africa, okay. and I'm going to discover myself because diaspora identity is the way. Yeah. And um, I knew I wanted to come and spend more time in Ghana. Yes. So um, after I finished university, doing my um, undergraduate, I did my gap year that people do mm -hmm. in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, I was, again, and I, I'm going to keep coming back to it because I can't get over how important being open to what you really want can actually help bring it to life, can manifest it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try not to use that word too often, but I knew I wanted to come back to Ghana and I knew I wanted to learn more about the development sector. Mm -hmm. And I'd been doing temping jobs as people do. And I was about to just give up. I wanted to take a break. I was like, I'm tired of this. And then my sister was like, no, 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 no. Take this call that they're calling you, take it. And it was a call to go and temp in one of like, the main development organizations in the UK. Okay. And so that was crazy. So I went and worked with them and then that became a job job. And then off the back of that, when I came to Ghana and had first introduction to Ghana lesson number one, <laughs> which was the job that was supposed to have been set up and waiting for me oh. was not here when I arrived. Wow. <laughs> the people I'd met at that organization helped connect me with people. Okay. And so that was the other thing that you, I learned really quickly as well. In the UK, it's very easy for you to become quite secluded and just make your decisions and make plans yourself. Mm -hmm. In Ghana, you have to ask people, you have to rely yes. on other people. Very true. And time and time again, I found that difficult, but it's also ridiculously rewarding. Mm -hmm. So um, I got a job with a Canadian research organization um, here in Ghana. And I worked with her for a while, and that just gave me a complete insight to the sector I thought I had wanted to work in. Mm -hmm. I did not. Mm. <laughs> the actual international development sector is extremely questionable. But it was very good experience. And then I also got introduced to an organization called African Women's Development Fund. Oh, yes. Which was, at that time, it had just, it had just begun it was the first African women-owned fund, mm -hmm. and it was just this amazing place of inspirational women. Mm -hmm. Coming from a space where the main African women I saw in the UK were my aunts, um, who were great people, but weren't necessarily the path I wanted to follow, sure. or the images you saw on Western TV of Africans, and believe me, even now it's not that great, but back then, worse, even yeah. worse, even yeah. worse. So. Seeing these women was confusing, but also really inspiring and, mm -hmm. and helped to shift, again, what was possible. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with them. And so I was in Ghana at that time for a, a couple of years. And then I moved back to the UK. And they connected me with another organization in the UK called Akina Mama Wa Africa. Mm. This time, even more amazing, inspirational African women, strong-minded, like, driven just just huge growth and learning experiences there. And then that kind of carried on the journey sure. into that sector. Got it. And worked with a lot of African-owned, driven organizations. So I've actually spent more time in African organizations than non-African hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. So 
So it's interesting listening to people's experiences of difficulties in the workplace when it comes to things of race and perception, blah, blah, blah. Right. Because I didn't face those in the same right. way. Right. You would have interactions because your sure. funders were probably non-black yes. and some of the main or bigger, not main, bigger organizations were also. But it wasn't a space you had to spend a lot of time in. Mm -hmm. So I didn't quite have to engage mm -hmm. in that same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So... You said the development sector is quite questionable. Yeah. And I think we who see it and have intertwined ourselves in it to some extent all have a little bit of a, you know, some kind of comment about it. So are you comfortable telling us a little bit more about your assessment? Why do you see and what role do you see and what would you expect or would want to see changed to make it more effective if that is even a possibility? I think, and this is me personally, these are not mm -hmm. the views of my organization or any other body other than myself. Okay. Sure. But um, I definitely see, and they are, I mean, it's not a secret. No, it's not. The development sector is funded by varying governments and institutions who have a particular mandate yes. and focus. Mm -hmm. So all of your funders, like it's, they do great work. Like the funding that they give is important. Our organizations like mine could not do the work we do without these funds. But at the same time, it is misguided, as you were saying in your opening, it is misguided to think that it's in their interests to see any of these developing countries, Ghana, countries in Asia, countries in India, and so on, to be fully formed, fully functional, and fully competitive. Right. It makes no sense right. to you as, I mean, if we're looking at it, as much as I am a benevolent country, I have responsibilities to my country and to the citizens within my country. Mm -hmm. If I put you in a better position than myself, how is that productive for me and my self-interest? Right. So it just has to be understood in regards to the fact of you will have enough help to make sure that you don't become a hindrance. Mm -hmm. So currently... Unfortunately, we have cases of high youth unemployment, for mm -hmm. example. This is an area that the organization I work with, Afford, is extremely passionate and focused on because high youth unemployment means you have a large number of a very active, energized, intelligent group of young people who have no outlet. Mm -hmm. They're not able to gain a proper income, which means they can't live out all the, all the experiences they want to live, be it educational, entrepreneurial, just wanting to do a job and get a nice house and have a nice husband, wife, and da, da 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 All of these life dreams and ambitions that others take for granted, you can have none of it with ease. Right. So then what are you going to do with all of that energy? You're going to look to see where can I find this outlet? And unfortunately, there are those who look to this surplus of energy and use it for ends that are unhelpful, terrorism, mm -hmm. um, crime, mm -hmm. fraud, mm -hmm. or taking their lives into their own hands and trying to cross mm -hmm. oceans and deserts mm -hmm. to seek this better life. And then unfortunately, though the life you're going to isn't great, it, it's generally really hard, uncomfortable, and for some people really degenerating of your spirit and body, both mm -hmm. physical and internal. Mm -hmm. But you make more money than you would at home. Yes. And so you weigh it up and then you take your chances. Then also you have the pressure of those at home who expect you to go and be amazing and help fund those who stayed behind. And I won't even go into the other layer of issues we're creating mm -hmm. with this and creating mm -hmm. new classes and distinctions. But mm -hmm. So these are the areas that is now of import to those who fund because they don't want high numbers of migrants coming into their country that they can't manage or who can't be put to a productive use for their own economies. Sure. So it really does come down to us. It really does. And it's heartbreaking to see the focus that we see so many of our governments on the continent. They're, they're aware, as, as others are aware, of these impending issues because they keep coming up. Mm -hmm. And rather than finding sustainable long-term solutions, we do a quick thing. We have a department of youth and enterprise that does program after program, and yet you don't see any real shifts. And so it does come down to us looking at what, do we need to do and the speaking to my friends who are entrepreneurs here it also very much comes down to what is the mindset we're teaching our young people because the character that many are coming across in terms of those that they're hiring for jobs mm -hmm. they're just very despondent 
they don't particularly, they're not engaged, they don't really want to work. Mm -hmm. They want to live the life that they see on Instagram. On Instagram and mm -hmm. on TV. When I first came to Ghana, the um, messaging was coming from those really terrible Latin no, oh, novella novellas. Yeah, yeah. And they thought that was everybody's life outside. Yeah. So they didn't believe that there was homeless people in the Western world. Right. They didn't believe that people, white people could be poor. Yeah. Now we have everybody. I don't even know what they believe, to be fair. But I, I do see that they're trying to emulate these influencer lifestyles mm -hmm. and and trying to be, so things like Forbes 30 under 30, 20 under 20, 40 under 40 mm -hmm. are great in recognizing some amazing work, mm -hmm. but they also put a lot of pressure yeah. on people. Sure. And so you're you're seeing people wanting to just win, like leapfrog. They want, yeah. they want to jump, they think, oh, well, if that person did it, I too can do it. Right. And the way they're going about doing that is doing things like some experiences, not all, obviously, but trying to steal people, their bosses' databases, thinking they can go and start up the business and do it themselves. Yes, that is Stealing a well-known, yeah, well-known fraudster activity. Right. There, yeah. And I don't know if people see that as theft or if they see that as a criminal act or see it even as a sin if you want to get into that. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I'm looking around and everybody is at church 24-7, mm -hmm. but your day-to-day -day behavior does not reflect your religious leanings and learning sure. you're quick to push the bible down my throat sure. but then i'll see you happily push past somebody on the street or cut somebody off on the road yeah. or overcharge for something yes. and all of these yeah. kind of things so it's there's a whole mindset shift that needs to take place mm -hmm. and it really has to start with our education mm -hmm. the religious institutions because they're highly influential mm -hmm. and at home obviously mm -hmm. right. but Home will be harder because you need parents parents to have a shift in their mindset to teach you the shift in your mindset. Exactly. So exactly. That's the harder kind of sell. Yeah. So for me, yes, development organizations have a place in the system and structure that we're living in currently. Mm -hmm. But as a country, being Ghana or as a continent, we also have to have our own strategy of how we take what is wished to be given and make it work for us as opposed to right now. We take what is given, which fits in somebody else's strategy, and then maybe, hopefully, it might help our situation. Or it won't, but, you know, we got this money, and yeah. so let's, yeah. so some let's few, see. So some few were able to rise, yeah. and, you know, that a makes few. everyone feel a little bit better. Like we did something. Yeah. Or, yeah. or as it has done, it creates another industry, which is the public sector industry. Sure. And so yeah. it, it feeds itself. Yes. And, um, and so that's an area that people look for as a job. Mm -hmm. And if it's a job with career prospects, it means that you don't see an end in sight, which means you're not working towards the end of poverty. You're not working towards mm -hmm. the end of a situation because mm -hmm. then you've worked yourself out of a job, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the aim of every NGO, yeah, a helpful institution. Yeah. You're supposed yeah. to be trying to work yourself out, out of, of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. You hit the, head, the nail on the head. <laughs> So I want to ask you, particularly around how you started, CESA, you mentioned starting with workshops, and I know that that was part of your transition from the capital sector. So give me a little bit of sense of why the where, in terms of how you landed with CESA. Okay. I guess CESA, and it's still in formulation. Okay. It's hopefully by, not hopefully, <laughs> by the end of this year, yes. it will be more forms sure. than it is now. But as I said, it came from the different experiences that I had been going through in my own growth and transition. Mm -hmm. And just recognizing that within the black community, be it in the UK, and definitely when I came to Ghana, and with the different experiences I've had with people as I've traveled around Africa, because our focus is so pinpointed on trying to make it, you haven't really got that time to sit and actually look at yourself and what makes you who you are. So it's I need to make money. Yeah. I need to break the glass ceiling. I, I'm being victimized in every area of my work. So then this personality is developing and a mindset's developing mm -hmm. where you almost stop connecting with and understanding and recognizing who you are at your core and you become this character that is in perpetual victimhood because of I'm black, I'm African, I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm young, I'm old, I'm... And then you forget that I'm also Elvina or Florence sure. or whatever. And, yeah. and I really like 
musicals. Yes, I do. And I really <laughs> like, you know, whatever it is. Yes. And so it was a, a journey of trying to get comfortable and remembering who I am outside of all of these titles. And even trying to get yourself to step out because it's really ingrained. Like you are making decisions and you are doing things that you think are your decisions, that you think are your objective. I'm thinking this out and I'm taking this path decisions. But when you sit and generally if you're able to come into contact with um, really empathetic and good listening people who can ask you really good probing questions, you'll start to see that a lot of your facts are not facts. They were the opinions of others Mm -hmm. or, and I know we're all saying the media, but yes, the media Mm -hmm. and the media includes our own media, our black media and the messages we give ourselves. And you take all of these things and then you begin to build your reality. Mm -hmm. And so coming to Ghana from having lived in the UK, being brought up Western, it threw me out of that for a moment because I'm not a minority anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm in a majority. Mm -hmm. I'm in a black country. Yes. But I'm still a minority because I'm Western. So there's a perception of who and how I am because I'm this Western girl who's now trying to be an African. And so that's why I now very much call myself a British Ghanaian Mm -hmm. because I had to come to terms with the fact that Mm -hmm. as Ghanaian as I thought I was, my first stint staying here sense of humor, um, peculiarities of culture, drinking tea 24-7 if you want to bring it down to that. But my outlook on life, my lack of understanding of cultural norms in Mm -hmm. Ghana, Mm -hmm. I had to to be like, I'm not helping myself by pretending that I'm this Ghanaian girl through and through. I'm definitely Ghanaian, but I I definitely have, you know, this element of Britishness running through me. So then it's having to renegotiate, having to Mm re-understand. And as I was speaking to people, and I started to run um, workshops um, called Making the Move Ghana. Making the Move, okay. Yeah, MTM Ghana, Making the Move Ghana. And then I would break it down, all the different things that you actually have to think about before you come. Because otherwise, you are going to frustrate yourself, Mm -hmm. and you will definitely frustrate others. But... In Ghana, they don't take on board other people's frustration. So you'll definitely end up mainly frustrating yes, yourself. Yes, that's true. Even that was something amazing to learn. In the UK, you annoy me, I'll annoy you back, and then we'll go back and forth until we lose our temper and leave in a rage. In Ghana, you annoy me, I try and annoy you, but you just don't take it on board. So then in the end, I just burn myself out and then we move on. Yeah. And so you, it was a shift in different, and in learning that there's other ways to live, there's other ways to see myself, mm-hmm. yourself, there's mm-hmm. other ways to interact on this planet. Yeah. Um, your norm isn't the norm. It was just a norm mm-hmm. that you had in one context. Right. You can change that context and right. you don't have to leave the country to change your context. Right. You do need to change your mindset and perception. Yeah. And so this is very much what I'm trying to find a way to shape and form mm-hmm. so that I can work with people to help them to shift that. Because, again, with this social media lifestyle and this living your best life, you've got to live your best life. And living your best life seeming to mean get slim if you're female, get slim, get really big butt and big boobs and go out raving or keep traveling to these amazing countries. It's all external. Mm-hmm. But what about the bit inside of you that helps you look at the world in a way that you stop feeling depressed, frustrated, limited, constricted in what you want to be doing? That makes it okay in your mind that I'm 42 and I want to wear skinny jeans. I'm going to wear my skinny jeans. These are the things that can help you have a better life that will give you the vision of what a best life could look like. And so it's very much about the interaction between the life we're living and the life we could live and then how that interconnects with other people. Mm -hmm. And so manifesting is key to that because it sounds like magic, this idea of manifestation. But when you break it right down to the core, I can give you an easy example. Okay, so even here, sitting here talking to you, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in London at the time my friend Olivia Asedu in tow, go and check out the podcast. Yes. <laughs> she did a podcast. And I was like, oh, why can't I do a podcast? Why couldn't that happen for me? No, 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 no. Did I reach out to Florence? No. Did I outline what it was I would particularly like to speak about 
and then put that to Florence? No. Did I find out what the process is to get onto the podcast? No. I sat there thinking I'm not doing enough to be visible in the great out there for Florence to see me and get in touch with me and invite me to be on her show. So I'm creating a world in this moment where I'm not going to get on Florence's show. I'm going to keep looking at Florence's show, wanting to be on it. As I've been in Ghana on this trip, I've started to take the time to structure out what it is. I'm a person who is global and local, lives between countries. I'm very interested in diaspora engagement. I'm going to speak to people more because I've started to get more and more enclosed because your your outlook on life starts to shrink as you start to get frustrated. You then get angry. And when you're angry, you don't want to interact with people. Yes, that's true. And so you see, these are the small ways that we're Mm -hmm. creating this life that we don't want. Yeah. So then I started to open up. Then you're speaking to people more, yeah. which means that I get to know my neighbor downstairs a bit more. Sure. And then I go and say hi to my neighbor. And then there's Florence. And then we start talking. And then as Florence is lit, she's like, oh, yeah, Alvina does some diaspora stuff. It would be good if you came on my show. Exactly. And then, there, and then so yeah. like, oh, my God, that's am- it's amazing. Yeah. Yes. But it's not in the realms of impossibility if you shift how yes. you live. Right. How, yeah, you, that how you just choose to So do. that's a that's a great segue into my question about mindset hack. Yes. So what would you say is your favorite one that you can imagine, one that you practice? What do you find is a, a wonderful mindset hack? Okay. Visualization. Ah, yeah. Visualization is a great mindset mm-hmm. hack. It takes different forms and it can come and it can manifest in different <laughs> time periods. Yes. So it could be an easy visualization like I really want chicken and chips, grilled chicken and chips. I really want that. And then I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it. And then I'm like, yeah, I actually really want that. And then you'll start doing the small actions that starts to bring it towards you. So you might thinking out loud and that's not even speaking. I've now, as I'm talking to you, it's come to me. Like there is a way that when you think really loudly, you're not speaking, but you're thinking a thought really loudly, almost like you're speaking. Mm -hmm something random happens. Yeah. That example, yeah. I was thinking extremely loudly because I was hungry and I really wanted that. And then I get a call. Hi V, I'm at the grilled chicken place. Did you want grilled? And then you're like, oh my goodness. And that one does have an element of magic in it. But yeah. when you really visualize, it is something about how your mind starts to think, oh, okay, this is serious. How are we going to make this work? Mm-hmm. So I was just saying, I've done a little thing for my Instagram and the three things I learned in Ghana and one of them is when you take life seriously it starts things start to happen to help you your mind gets into gear Mm -hmm. and so when you've got a really clear picture of what you want to achieve anything from that grilled piece of chicken to a home in Ghana to being a millionaire and what that means And you open yourself up to the steps of getting there. And then you walk the steps of getting there. Mm -hmm. Almost anything. I won't even say almost. Anything is possible. The caveat to that and the learning to that is that you may not get it in the way you particularly visualized it. So another example. I really wanted a property of my own in Ghana. Mm -hmm. It's the way that mortgages and stuff work here is quite different. But I was really clear I wanted an apartment in Ghana on the first floor above with a balcony. Very clear on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to afford it because I'd just taken a semi-sabbatical. But I was very clear and that's what I wanted. And put it out there, visualized it, spoke about it to particular people. Not everybody, particular people. And then I came and saw the apartment we're having a conversation in where mm-hmm. our, our friends also live. Yes. And I loved the place. I was like, this is it. But I don't want it to be on the ground floor. But I love this place. Yes. And then a flat became available as I was meant to leave. So I was meant to leave a month ago. Oh, okay. And then the landlord came to me a couple of weeks before I was going to leave and was like, oh, one of the apartments upstairs on the first floor is going to be available. Do you want to take it? And it meant renting. And I hadn't contemplated renting. Ah. In my Mm -hmm. mind, I wanted a property in Ghana, but I hadn't thought that it was going to be a rental property because in my mind, it was always going to buy it and then it would also be an investment property. As it's turned out, I've rented it for a year. Okay. When I'm not here, it's an investment property. Right. And and so I just sat there and I was like, oh my goodness, that's what I was asking for. And it came to me in a way that was affordable. Yeah. 
And I won't even tell you the magic of being able totally. to afford to furnish it and everything else. Yeah. But it all sort of gravitates to when you've got the right outlook. Yes. But if your outlook is, I don't want to rent a place, I want to buy a place. No. Right. Then you've just shut off this whole area of opportunity. It's true. Because your mind is closed. Yes. Whereas when you can open it up, ask some questions, think a little differently, it really can change so much for you. Mm-hmm. I second that on the visualization. I just remember all every apartment that I lived in, I walked in and I was like, okay, I see myself here. And so immediately my mind started to decorate. And so literally every apartment that I had, even to the one in New York that I, I currently, mm-hmm. you know, finally own, right? Because the moment I went into that apartment, it was a rental. And I said, I'm going to own this place. There we go. And it happened, right? And so I furnished it. And so... And it, it's so interesting because I recognize when I don't see the picture, then I can't, it doesn't happen for me. It doesn't happen. Because so. when you see the picture, you can almost live it. Exactly. Because then you'll be like, okay, the wind, no, no, I wouldn't have those curtains. Actually, I'd have blinds. Uh-huh. And, then, and then the picture becomes more and more. And then you're yes. walking around. That, those are the curtains I'd have. Yes. That's the such and such I'd yes. have. And then it's almost like something's like, okay, so we're going to have this. This is going to be ours. And then it, voila. Conversations happen, income, something comes, it's weird. I think that when you said, oh, it just sounds like magic, I think that we need to embrace magic. Like magic is real. Yes. Like it really is real. And so I will say, I think we're on the the cusp of a full moon. For you listeners out there, particularly around the full moon, Mm -hmm. try this. Because you will see that, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's women's things. But the lunar energy really does provide an opening window If you're not celestial thinking, you know, just try it, yeah. you know, get back to me. But, but that's something that's actually And that's quite true. Been something I've experienced with this trip because I wasn't mm-hmm. into moons mm-hmm. and all. The, but it's suddenly like this particular trip, it's really come to me. And like, yeah, as Florence says, try it. Try it. And, and try not to be freaked out when, yeah. when things happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing. Like, so I've done, I've, I've read things like The Secret and Laws of Attraction. Uh-huh. And I have to say, on one particular magic year, it worked so well. I got so freaked out. I, shut I stopped. It down. I shut it oh, down. Oh, no. I know. It was too much. Yeah. It was too, yeah, yeah. too Harry Potter awakening sure, ones. Yeah, yeah. It was you, too much. You can't be afraid, though. That's, That's the thing. You have to have the courage so to keep on. Now, years it. later. Yeah. So all the years somewhat, not wasted, everything's a learning, but it could have been very different if I'd been able to be comfortable with that whole Sure law of attraction we are magnetic beings and you know that you've experienced it now and again you think of a person they ring you you're walking down the street and you're thinking oh i'd really love a fill the blank and then suddenly everywhere you look everybody's driving that color car or eating that ice cream or Mm -hmm. whatever it is Mm -hmm. so it's just learning how to tighten that in and and Mm -hmm. make it work for you not even manifest it but learning the skills of how to tap into manifestation visualization yeah And also visualization can help you to change relationships Mm. as well, Mm -hmm. especially if you can go really, not exactly deep, but really granular Mm. with your visualization. Mm -hmm. So I've been using that for difficult conversations Mm. or for Mm -hmm. non-difficult conversations, the ones that you really want to have and you feel too nervous or shy to have, where you actually have that conversation and imagine how it would feel and how it would flow and all of these things. So one thing I do now when I go networking, before, you know, you'd be hungry. Like, I need to speak to this person and this person and this person. And obviously everybody else does. So you look around the room and they've got a crowd of people around yeah. them. So what I started to do was, I want to speak to that person. If not today, that person will come to me because I need to speak to them and they need what I need to give them. Mm-hmm. And either I'll be having a drink at that event and then that person will walk up and be like, oh, hey, how are you? Or I will get an email later on from that person and so there is something about having the right energy that you put onto your visualization and allowing yourself to connect with it so that when a situation happens it's almost like you remember how to behave yeah so you don't feel as scared or as nervous Mm -hmm. or um you don't get your barriers up if that's something that you do and push people away. Mm-hmm. You're able to, because you remember that, oh, we did this and it was fine and I was comfortable and I had the right things to say. And then it flowed. Yeah. So visualization is definitely something I encourage people to read about. There's so much, so, yeah. so, so much yeah. online. Yeah. 
and just play with that. Yeah. And it's fun, actually. Right, you know, people have made it into a, kind of a market of the vision boards yeah. and all that. So I'm like, it's real. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you really put it together, you see it, and then it becomes... That's it. Yeah. And, and it does, yeah. Like, <laughs> give it a go. Yes. And it just, like with anything, actually, what's it called? You can go at it with extreme cynicism, mm-hmm. but just give it a go anyway. Mm-hmm. Just do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Great mindset hack. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what you hear when you're on the road, on in on the road, mm. in the spaces, talking to young women. What would you say is your your favorite global speak? My favorite global speak. Um, oh gosh, I don't know. Let me think. Give me like an example. Okay, so the classic example here in Ghana is Chale. Different. Okay, so on the, on the cusp of the chale, mm-hmm. my favorite for years, and the one that is so telling for people wanting to come and live, experience whatever Ghana, you must exercise patience. Uh huh. <laughs> it, it, it makes you want to hurt somebody when you come out here and live that experience, but it gives you a true understanding of what patience really means. Yeah. And hopefully, you'll get to a point where you learn to embody it because once you're able to do that. Living in Ghana and, and spaces like Ghana um, become a lot easier. Yeah. And you become a lot calmer as a person. Yeah. Because really understanding this idea of patience is understanding that your way is not the way. Yes. Be that your personal way or the context from which you've come. So the favorite from diaspora mm-hmm. in, in the UK or tourists is, it doesn't make sense, but it's not common sense. <laughs> and so my response to that is sense isn't common and it's contextual bound. So what makes yeah. sense in the UK, in London even, not even just in the UK, because if you go to other cities, towns, it's true. it changes again. The common sense that you will experience is that born from the experiences in the context yes. you're now in. Yes. So there's many things in Ghana that make no sense to mm-hmm. us if you've been born outside for a long time. Mm-hmm. When you've been here a while, then you begin to see, oh, okay, that's why they do what they mm-hmm. do. That's why nobody rushes or particularly makes solid plans because mm-hmm. somebody can tell you it will be ready for you on Wednesday. So then you make plans to use that thing on Thursday. Mm-hmm. You go to pick it up Thursday morning because that's what you were told mm-hmm. and it's not there. Right. <laughs> and then you've messed up all these yes. other plans. Yes. So everybody keeps everything ambiguous. Yeah. Because there is no definite. Is that the way it should be? Shouldn't be. We're not going to get into that discussion right now. Right. But exercise patience is is one of those sorts of things that you definitely need to take on board. Yeah. And that's, um, true. that's a great example. The yeah, you make pl- the, it is the loosey goosey of plans is real. Yeah, yes, it's very real. And you will spend a lot of time just being so frustrated and irritated. Mm-hmm. For yeah. example, this morning, I've had to talk myself back down. Obviously, I've been out of the system for too long. <laughs> um, went to the bank to go and sort something out, which I'd been told was all sorted out. It seemed on the surface that had all been done. I was super impressed. Mm-hmm. And then I went into the bank and it isn't done. But if you find the right person, they will bend over backwards to then fix it as quickly as possible. Yeah. So Thursday may not be possible. Friday may happen. Saturday sure. could be a definite. Right. Could <laughs> maybe possibly... <laughs> You just need to exercise patience. Yeah. It's so, true. um, it's yeah, true. that I think is my key one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay. So in the business of this business, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit more about the mechanics and the operations of, you know, really starting and structuring what you're structuring. So you guys are on this journey with me right now. Yes. So it started off as wanting to be an organization that delivered workshops and trainings and helped give people the information and resource they needed to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But um, as I've grown and as time has moved forward, I realize now that that isn't quite what I want it to fully be. That isn't the fullness of it. So as I was saying, it's definitely a community. Mm -hmm. Um, It's focused on women of color, black women, Mm -hmm. over the age of 35, who are going through numbers of different changes and challenges and positives Mm -hmm. at a point in life where you would have had a number of experiences that influence your outlook. And so as we were talking about earlier, your perspective may not be as open as it could be for what could be your next stage Mm -hmm. of life. Yeah. Because at this stage of our lives, between 35 and 40, 
you might be doing career change. You could be a new mother. You could be a mother of four and your children are about to leave home. Yeah. You could be going through divorce. You could be about to get married for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many different things happening, body mm -hmm. changing, mm -hmm. possibilities that if you've got an ingrained mindset that I've hit 40, which is society seems to really push this on women, 40 and you're out. Yeah. Whereas... As I'm seeing, it's 40 and it's a new wave for exactly. lots of people. Yeah. It's a new job. It's a new career. It's a new opportunity. It's right. a new business. Mm -hmm. Be it because circumstances have changed or because your mind has changed. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to create a space that taps into um, black professionals who can assist the community on their journey. Because the um, health issues, for example, yeah. of a black woman in her 40s, can be quite different from a white woman. Um, and it is. So yeah. fibroids is a key issue. Mm -hmm. And the way it's dealt with in the Western world is completely unhelpful from a number of black women and how their bodies are treated mm -hmm. and how they're treated or not treated effectively. Yeah. But there are doctors, black doctors on the continent, off the continent, who've spent a lot of time focusing on this. There are health professionals. There are people who've been through having fibroids and have found different holistic ways of dealing with it through diet sure. and exercise and a meditation and mindset mm -hmm. and understanding that when we have these growths and these pains and these um, discomforts within our bodies, it's generally our way of our body's way of holding on to hurts and yes. upsets and frustrations. Yes. So all the medication and surgery in the world may help, but it, it won't go to the core of the matter. Right. And so this is some of what I want to bring into people's lives through CESA. Mm -hmm. So it will be webinars. It will be in-person events. Okay. It will be a directory of black professionals okay. that people have access to. Mm -hmm. um, it will be retreats. Mm -hmm. So I'm planning my first retreat in okay. September. Yay. It's called Release. And it will be taking place in Accra. Okay. And it's going to be five days, four nights for women to come and release, learn how to relax. Mm -hmm. I had to teach myself how to relax in this trip because I've forgotten how. I oh. can't sit and switch off. Yeah. My mind would still be going. Yeah. And so we think as we sit and veg out in front of why, was it married to medicine or any you know, of those? Any of that, that. TV. Yeah. It switches your mind off. It's a distraction. Yes. But distraction and relaxation are not the same thing. Very true. So it's actually learning how to relax so your body can. Yes. That's so the, it. Yes. Exactly what you did with your hand. Yes. Come down. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And let your mind release a bit because yes. we have so much going on yeah. in there. Yeah. And so this is what the retreat would be for. And so this on the ongoing support is what Cessa would be providing. Okay. Nice. So that's what we're building. Nice. So if yourselves fit into um, the service provider, what's the word? I just description of who we want to bring on board to help other women in mm -hmm. the community please get in touch yes and um, we'll put that in the show notes so, and, and you can tell us now where how do listeners get, get in touch, touch. Mm -hmm. so the email currently is sesa sessa for number four life at gmail.com okay and equally the website's a little complicated it needs to be uh, reduced down but if you google yeah. sessa for life sesa for life yes the Instagram will pop up, the website based on WordPress will pop up, and then as it develops and grows, it'll be easier to connect and yeah. communicate. But I looked at your website, looks fine. This is oh, that let you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm like, no, I just read a blog post. Like, what are you talking about? Yes. So, so yeah, please, I will put the website on there. So you our see listeners... that people, an yes. example you right there of how we restrict ourselves exactly. by our misconstrued Exactly, yeah, the website says, a lot. It's very, it's very Elvina. So yes. yeah, please do visit. I'll put that in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're, we're, we're excited for that. We're looking thank forward to, to knowledge and, and more information. So mm -hmm. let's take a, you know, speaking of distractions yes. and, and other things, tell us more. Are you a listener? Are you a watcher or are you a reader? I'm a reader. Okay. So tell us some of your, your most recent beloved books. Okay. So the one I'm in love with at the moment, and I made sure I had it to hand, okay. is called Psycho Cybernetics mm -hmm. by Maxwell Maltz. Okay. And a friend suggested this to me because we were talking about the numerous mental blocks that I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. And the book is about how our brain works mm -hmm. and how to make your brain work for you. Mm -hmm. And as Oprah says, the book is a, just, it's 10 chapters of aha moments. Uh -huh. Literally just back to back, you're like, 
Oh, oh <laughs> that's me. Right. And again, it's not an easy journey because you have to look at your, I don't want to say failings, but yes. your areas of work, your right. areas of development. Sure. I'll say that much. But it then can help you to see why certain things are or aren't happening in your life. Yeah. And then that takes that magic out of it. That takes that. I don't uh, know why right, this always so happens you to me. believe in the universe. science. Yeah. 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 When no, it's because you did this, this, and this, and this, and you've been doing it. Okay. And so now you think this is life, yeah. when it isn't. And it helps you to shift all of that. So I definitely would recommend that. It's The audio book is on YouTube. But the book has exercises at the end of each oh, okay. chapter. Okay. So I started on audio and then I switched to buying the book so I could sure, do the jot things down. Yeah. Brene Brown okay. is really good. I've yeah. forgotten the name of the book at the moment, but it, it the way it talks about shame and helping us to move forward yeah. with relationships with others yeah. is really, really good. And what else have I been reading that I love? And then Oprah, again, the name has escaped me. She has a really lovely little book and I bought it for a number of people. Mm-hmm. And that too, I know what I know. Oh, Yamla Venter. No. I know this. Oh, no, not that, not that one. Then. Okay. It's an Oprah book, and it's oh, something that. about her knowing, and, ah, and she's okay. sharing it. So oh, is it Oprah wrote it? Oprah wrote it. Oh, okay, yeah, This Much I Know. This Much I Know. Yes, there yes, we go. Yes, 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 yes. So that was also very helpful. Yeah, that is a good book. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so definitely a reader. Okay. Um, in terms of watching... I mean, in terms of watching, I just still love Matrix. I think Matrix was the original film for helping us learn yeah, about... to transcend. Yes, yeah. that this life game is a game. Yeah. It's, it is not all that it seems. Yeah. So, especially for, I guess, younger listeners who don't know about Matrix, because it, it shocks me when I say it and people don't know about Matrix. It's true, yeah. One, maybe two. Don't kill yourself to watch all of them, but definitely watch number one. Yes, um, definitely, and, yeah. And like you said, maybe two. Maybe yeah, two. Matrix is good. Yeah. It's so funny you say that because I was thinking somehow I read something, I was reading something about man-child, a man-child, mm-hmm. and so it made me think of Curious Life of Benjamin Button. Button. Mm. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna have to watch that again because that was so curious to see how people's yeah. perceptions of who you are based on how you mm-hmm. look then, you know, manifested in, you know, this life of this person who was very challenged. Yeah. You know, and so the man child thing is that there are these small people, mm-hmm. a boliga or something. Okay. Like they're actually real apparently, that were just people who never grew. They they went through the in seven years, they go through the whole cycle of infancy to elderly. Wow. Yeah. In seven years. Yeah. 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 So they don't live long. So they're tiny, but they go through the whole thing. And I'd seen some, I'd seen pictures, but I just was reading it actually this morning. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. And that's what made me think of Benjamin yeah. Button. So. Because I mean, like I've been, again, the mindsets of people, if you're coming from somewhere else and you move into another space, I just find it fascinating because somebody else's perception of life is going to be completely Absolutely. Different, their outlook completely different. The books they read, the yeah. things they watch, the interactions yeah. they have. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much to learn. There is. I interviewed my friend's aunt. She's 90 something. Wow. And it just reminds me how important it is to speak to older people because so many of us think our experiences are the experience. Oh. This is all new. Nobody else has been through what yeah. I've been through. No. And they have. They just, we just don't ask. We exactly. just don't ask. Exactly. And, yeah. and so it's so interesting to just start speaking to other people. And this is coming from someone who's had barriers up for a while. So it's right. almost like coming out of the darkness. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, people are interesting and cool. Yeah. Again. So, yeah. Yeah, just de- definitely speaking to the elders. Like, I mm. think they get so forgotten and... Definitely. knowing that African stories are passed on through, I mean, everybody's stories, mm-hmm. but particularly in Africa, we, okay. in curating our own histories, mm-hmm. we really need to talk to our elders, those who live yeah. through independence, yeah. who live through that time, because I think we're also not remembering, and that's the reason why we're kind of stuck, is that we here coming, like, me, you and I lived abroad, mm-hmm. so our colonial experience is very different. Like, mm-hmm. I'm living in America, and I'm with you. Yes. I call myself, I'm Ghanaian American, American. Yeah. I mean, I'm the American cousin, right? because I just don't have the context yes. at all. But so, but coming from those places, slavery in the post-colonial U.S. is entirely different mm-hmm. from the colonialism that is what is Africa now. Yes. And if we don't speak to the people who lived it to understand why we are still in the same place we are because they are still, to some extent, the ruling class. Yeah. 
So until we decide yes. how to dismantle that mindset that they have, we're, we're still going to be disjointed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Definitely. So, yeah. I mean, a prime example for me, I've been coming back and forth, like in the proper yo-yo since I was 22, I think. So yeah, literally 20 years. And um, the people who I knew when I first came to Ghana, the young people mm -hmm. full of life and passion, and we're going to change this, are the ones who are now leaders. Mm -hmm. And so something in there shifts and all of that energy and that verb and that idealism, mm. it shifts and changes and becomes the norm. Mm. And so it would be interesting to know what happens in that interim. And I know life happens, you know, suddenly the responsibilities, the family are upon you, mm -hmm. the need to live in a certain way, mm -hmm. and the cost of living in Africa is not cheap. So if you want yeah. good education for your child, if you sure. want good health care, yeah. but then also the structures, trying yeah. to shift the structures within which the political system is yeah. made both internally and externally yeah. is work. Yeah, it's work. So, and it's not for the faint of heart. No. At all. And so, and it may not end well. Exactly. <laughs> in whatever way exactly. that that comes. So it's yes. also a huge level of bravery in it. Yeah. But um, there is still much we can do. Mm -hmm. it, it, start, it literally does. I mean, there's a whole campaign of fix Ghana. Yeah. But it's very outward looking. It's government fixed Ghana mm -hmm. without really understanding that the government are a reflection of us. Of us. So you yeah. can shout government fixed Ghana and then you still will do any number of still random things. in the middle of the street. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of these sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. So it's a partnership. Yes. Your government is really reflecting you. So whatever the government is yeah. doing is what you're allowing. Yeah. And that means also to whatever extent on your micro level, you're doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise you'd care more and you'd right. want to see change more. Yeah. But it's yeah. like, oh, that's terrible. Right. And then you go and do your own version exactly. of that thing. Exactly. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see where we are. It is hard to stay. Yes. Stay um, rah, 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 rah. Exactly. <laughs> stay energized. But yeah. please do. Yes. Um, we, we're trying. I'm trying. It goes yeah. up and down. Yeah. Those are great last words. I appreciate those. Yes. Those are wonderful. So just, you know, folks, the, the hashtag that had been going around in Ghana is fix Ghana, fix the country, or and fix yourself. Okay. So, so those are the two. Yeah. So it's juxtaposed, but it is one and the same, mm. ultimately. Completely. So that's the Ghana just for today. Elvina, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So as always, listeners, you can catch us at www.glocalcitizenspod.com and wherever you get your podcasts. Our show notes will be, again, very rich. And you can find out more about Elvina and all the wonderful work she's done there. And please share, comment, tell a friend, suggest a guest. We'd love to hear from you. So until next time, bye for now.